Well, so much of what people tell you when you're a teenager is like designed to try to help you make the right decisions as an adult. I mean, think about it. Everything from talking about college to talking about finances to talking about relationships. So much of it is just people trying to say, hey, you're at the beginning of life right now. I want you to get this all set up so you do things the right way. And a lot of that's about commitments, right? Especially when it comes to college. There's so much that goes into getting a lot of you ready for college. There's SAT prep. There's ACT prep. There's mock SAT tests, mock ACT tests, the real SAT, the real ACT, and uh, college essays and college applications. Think about like how much of all that, like what's the point of all that? All of it is just trying to get you ready to go to college. And college is a big commitment, right? It's three, four years, depending on how long you're there. It's pretty serious. You should probably visit the college before you say, yeah, I'm definitely going to go there for a long time. It's a big commitment. And then all of that's really to set you up to have a career, right? And you're going to work at your career, hopefully, longer than you went to college, just training to do that career. So that's a pretty big commitment. And then after that, there's other commitments like, you know, you're going to buy a house one day, perhaps, and that's a pretty big commitment. And you should know what you're getting yourself into when you buy a house. You should make sure it's the right kind of house. You should make sure you can afford it. All these things, basically, as a teenager, you start to learn about, and then you make the commitment when you're an adult. It's not any different when it comes to relationships. But in fact, all of those things I just mentioned, college, careers, houses, here's the thing. You can change all of those. Like, you can Go to one and then transfer to another. You can go to one college and transfer to another college. You could go start in one major and end with another major. You could start one career and then at some point in life, you could change careers. That's okay. You could buy one house and then later get rid of that house, sell that house, and buy a new house. But when it comes to relationships, there's one relationship that so many people treat like all those other things, college, career, buying a house. They think that they can just start it and end it and start and end it however they want to, but that's not exactly how God has designed it. It's the relationship called marriage. And the problem is most people who enter marriage today, who, you know, they they plan a wedding, they invite people, they get a nice dress, they get a nice suit, they walk down an aisle wherever they do it, most people who get married today are grossly underprepared for what they're getting themselves into. Most people... In fact, don't even know what they're getting themselves into. I don't want that to be true for any of you. I want all of you, when you get to that stage of life, to know not only what Christians say about marriage, that's a lot less important. It's really important to know what does God say about marriage? What is marriage? What isn't marriage? If that's like the most important permanent decision, most personal decision, most intimate decision, like you should know what God has to say about that. And the good news is the Bible tells us a lot about marriage. And even in the first two chapters of the Bible, that that's all we've been studying so far in the book of Genesis. It's just Genesis 1 and 2. Do you know what Genesis 1 and 2 is all about? God's design for humanity before there was sin. God's perfect design. This is the last text that we'll study about a world that's untainted by sin. Starting next week, we'll talk about all the effects of sin, And the problems of sin. But right here in Genesis chapter 2, it would be good for you to grab a Bible, open up to Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18, to read the end of this chapter that we've been studying. It's all about God's design for men, for women, and for their relationship together in marriage. People think that God does not have a lot to say about this. Well, God does have a lot to say about it. And we'll start here in Genesis chapter 2, but we're going to turn to some other passages all over the Bible that talk about marriage. So, Last week, the freshmen were not ready for statistics. Well, this is going to be worse than statistics today. Talking about marriage. There we go. All right. Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 18. Which before all this, remember, like, God's making stuff. He's making people. He's making things. Do you know what God has often said about the things he's made? It is good. It is good. Even at the end of chapter 1, he says, this is very good. Look what he says. In verse 18, look what God says. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good. Whoa, time out. There's a problem here. This is the first time in the history of the universe up until this point that something has been not up to God's standards. That something has been not good. This is the first time ever. It says something's not good. It's not good that man should be alone. 
I will make a helper fit for him. Okay, question. Whose idea was it to create women? Was it man's idea or was it God's idea? It was God's idea. Maybe that's why guys have a hard time understanding women, right? Because this was God's idea, not man's idea. Now, man would have maybe come up with something at some point, but no, no, God looked. And notice that, like, it doesn't say that the man looked and said, this is not good. He doesn't say that. Now, he might have said that at some point, but this is God's declaration that it's not good for man to be alone. Now, this is not just a lonely, sad emo boy saying I need friends, okay? This is God saying about one guy, because there is only one person, one human being on the planet at this point. He says, that's not good, okay? It's not good that man should be alone. So what's God going to make for him? A dog, a cat? No. He's going to make a helper fit for him. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So there's a pattern here that starts that we'll see replicated with the woman, but there's some differences. One difference is he's going to say, how was uh, the, the beast? How were they made? What did God make them out of? This says the ground. Okay, so out of the ground, God brings these animals, just like he brought man out of the ground. You want to know something? That's not how he made woman. He did not make woman out of the ground. He's going to make woman differently. That's a very important thing. And then also, what do you see here? God's giving these, uh, these animals to him and say, okay, great, you're the one that's supposed to have dominion. You're supposed to rule. What do you call these animals? Right? And how long did this take? I don't know. Right? Some people think this all was contained in creation day number six. That's possible, but that's not, I don't think, necessary. This could have happened um, later. But the point is, he's showing them all these animals and saying, okay, it's your job to tell us and tell the world what this is. So Adam's using his intellect. He's making decisions. He's using some discernment, right? And all these, these animals, whatever God showed him here, he names. So he was giving names to all the livestock and all the birds of the heavens and of every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So even there, maybe we start to see Adam thinking, I just saw all these animals, right? And he saw male and female animals. It wasn't like there was only male before this, right? There were male and female animals, but there was no female person. And at this point for him, maybe he's just thinking, I don't know, maybe this is just how it's going to be. Maybe he is starting to feel the loneliness that God says he has in verse 18. But either way, verse 21 says, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. So the idea is it's like, all right, God puts this guy to sleep. Does he go to sleep on his own? Not necessarily. God knocks him out, okay? And this is going to happen a few more times in the book of Genesis that we'll read about that God knocks someone out and puts him in a deep sleep. And what always happens when God knocks someone out and puts them in a deep sleep, God does something while they're sleeping and the person doesn't know what's happening, okay? That, which obviously, because they're in a deep sleep. That's the point. But think about it. Uh, Adam, when, when he sees woman in a second, he can take no credit whatsoever at all for designing this girl, okay? Because he was in a deep sleep. He is passive and God is active, right? That's very, very important. He's in a deep sleep. What does God use? Uses one of his ribs. Now, the word rib literally in the Hebrew is just the word that means side, okay? But one of his sides. That's why it's usually interpreted what's, you know, one of his sides, well, maybe it was a rib, okay? We don't know if it was actually his rib. We just know this came out of his body. But from the earliest interpretations, people have always thought this is talking about one of Adam's ribs. That's possible, right? It could have just been part of his side, but not his rib. But we do know is it's like God reaches into Adam's body while he's asleep, so he doesn't know what's going on. He's not feeling this. And then God closes up the wound, right? So he, it's not like, oh, man, what'd you do? It's like he's fine, afterwards, right? And remember, if you think that's like, God can't do that, well, like, read what he just said he did. Like, he made everything out of nothing, and then he formed man out of the dust. So this is like a lower-level miracle that's taking place right now to close up his side, right? The bigger miracle is what he does with this rib. Look what it says. It says, um, in verse 21, after this deep sleep was on him, he took this rib, closed up its place with flesh, in verse 22, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man 
he made into a woman. Now, if you have a footnote next to the word made in your Bible, like I do in mine, follow down to the bottom of the page what that word literally means. It's not the word to make or create. It's not the word bara that we looked at, which means uh, to create. This is a different word. This is the word which means to build, okay? So he built a woman, right? That's a weird way of putting it. It's like odd to say it that way. But the point is, when you build something, that's more than just speaking into existence, just like with humanity. How does he make the man. He creates forms, thoughtfully designs the man from the dust. Now what does he do? He thoughtfully, creatively forms the woman from the man, from his literal biological material. He makes a woman. And then it says, he brought her to the man. So do you notice the similarities with what has just happened? God makes something out of something and then brings it to the man. The beasts of the field, all those animals, he makes them out of the ground, brings them to the man to have them named, okay? What does he do with the woman? Well, he makes a woman from the man, so different source, but God still makes it and forms it, and it's the woman in this case. And then what does God do? Presents the woman to the man, similar to what he did with the animals. But now his reaction is, oh, finally, not an animal, basically. Look at verse 23. He says, and the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And those words, again, if you follow the footnote in your Bible, this is super helpful. Those two words in Hebrew are a lot like the two words in English, man, woman. They're like related etymologically, right? They come from the same kind of source. Ish and Isha, they're very similar to each other. He says, okay, she's going to be called woman. So now he names the woman like he named the animals. Now, all that is the text. That's what takes place in the story. Look at verse 24. He, get, he steps out of the story, and he says, okay, because that's how God did it in God's original design in the garden, because that's what the narrative says, verse 24 says, okay, here's what everybody should do when it comes to this topic. Verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So this is the narrator. This is Moses stepping out saying, okay, guys, here's the thing. Because that's how God did it, here's God's rules for all of marriage. Here's how it works. Leaving father and mother, holding fast to to a spouse, which again, even that, right, those two words, to leave and to hold fast are opposites of each other that are sometimes used together in the rest of the Bible to say, you give up one thing to take on another thing. You give up the highest loyalty to mom and dad. You take on the highest loyalty to this new person, to the spouse. And then the result is they shall become one flesh. Verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Right? That's the part you were looking for. There's the freshman time. Right? Okay. Uh, like, what's with it? Why are they naked? That's weird. Why are they naked? Okay. Well, there's no reason for there to be any barrier or problem or shame or anything wrong between these two people at this point, because it's all perfect. There's no shame. There's nothing to be hiding. There's no past to be ashamed of. There's nothing that would bring insecurities in any way about either one of them, because guess what? They are made perfect, okay? Just notice, like, what's the first thing that a person ever says? A human being. What's the first thing a human being ever says in the entire Bible? It's verse 23. It's Adam praising his wife. He's just like so excited. Like, oh, a girl, right? And verse 25 shows you the condition of that girl when he sees her first, okay? It's very good. God says this woman was good. Now, this is how God did it. And then verse 24 is like a, like a command. Like, okay, this is how it works now for us, which is why some of us look at this and say, great, this is before sin. Like, sin messes everything up. Is anything the same? And Moses says, yeah, yeah. No, it is. Verse 24 is very helpful. That's a teaching for all of humanity. This is how it works with marriage. Do you see how even if you didn't know any of this stuff, right, you would probably be at a big lack when it comes to what marriage is. If you thought that marriage was something that you got to define on your own terms instead of something that God made and designed, and he says what the rules are for it, then you might think, well, marriage is meant to make me happy. I'm going to marry somebody who makes me happy. And you know what? The moment they don't make me happy, if it's better for me not to be in the relationship, then I'll get out of the relationship. That doesn't work. 
That's not how God designed marriage. Super important for everything we think about with marriage. And super important for you as you prepare. I know it sounds weird to say prepare to get married, but again, uh, this is probably something that's not like 20 years away for most of you. This is probably within a decade for most of you that this is going to be a reality for a lot of you to get married. So what do we learn from this passage? I think two big categories. We learned about the creation of woman, right, and what the whole purpose and what that was all about, and then we learned about marriage. Those are kind of our two big topics. Those are our two big things this morning, and I want to start with this whole creation of woman. What can we learn that will shape our worldview from how God does this, okay? Point number one, understand God's design for men and women. Understand, like, what's his whole plan? What's the purpose in all this? What can we learn from this text and from other texts? Well, the first, ladies, is going to make you feel pretty good, okay? So we'll give this one to you and all of you. Okay, letter A. What do you notice in verse 18? Do you notice God looks at a guy by himself and says, it's not good that he doesn't have a girl. Not good that he's by himself, right? We, we, need, some, uh, we need some female in this world, right? We need some femininity in this world. So, Letter A, you can write down like this. One thing you should take away from this is that man is incomplete without woman. Man, which is the general term, right? Even Adam's name means man, so it's sometimes hard to know when to translate it Adam and when to translate it man. But man is incomplete without woman. And I mean that in a general sense. This world is not right and it is not good unless there are women in this world. You don't have the full range of masculinity. I mean, think about a world without women, right? Like, what would that world be like? Right? Maybe some improvements, but not many, right? Most, most of the things would be bad, right? Think about a world without women, right? I, well, it's hard to picture a world without women, right? Because of how the world's set up. You all came from a woman, right? But that would be a different kind of world. Now, I mean, if you thought about a world without men, right, that's a whole other problem, Right? But at least in this section, there was a time when the world did not have women. And all it had was a man. And God says it's not good. Okay? Furthermore, if you think about how God says this, he says it's not good for man to be alone. That's another problem. That men and women can help solve a problem with each other for. That the problem of loneliness. The need for companionship. Like You understand that you need people. And that's a very clear thing we learn from Genesis 2, verse 18. You need other people in your life. The way it's put in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, you can write this down. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their toil. For if they fall, one will be there to lift up his fellow. Like Even if you're not talking about romantic connection, you know what's really needed? You need friends. You need people. You need a brother. You need a sister in life. You need someone to have companionship with. He says, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and there's no one there to lift him up. That's Ecclesiastes 4.9. So this is not good. The world's not good without women. Did you hear that? Ladies, did that make you feel good? Right? Oh, yeah, that's true. We, we're needed. You are needed in this world. In fact, when the Bible talks about a, a man getting married later on in, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, you can write that one down, Proverbs 18.22, it says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord, right? Find a good wife, that's like one of the best things a guy can do, right? That is so good as a gift from God. And all the other connections that people have, by the way, you know, friendship, those kind of things, they are not as close as the relationship between a husband and wife right? because of what he's going to explain later. There's something about the oneness of husband and wife that far uh, supersedes all other kind of relationships. I'm not sure if you've thought about the implications of that when you think about romance and dating and love, but like the whole goal is to find someone that you'll connect with in a big way. So, ladies, that was probably exciting for you, right? Yeah, that was a good one for you, okay? Here's some other things that you learn about men and women, okay? Uh, Letter B, you can write it down like this. Uh, woman is made for man, right? That is what the text says. Woman is made for man. See, this is the one I didn't think you'd like so much, right? So, ladies, you got point A. Guys, you probably like point B a little bit better. What is the purpose of the creation of woman? Right? God says it's not good. What's not good? It's not good that man's alone. Right? I will make a helper fit for him. Okay? What is this woman? What is her purpose? Her purpose is to be a helper fit for Adam, the man. So 
like, oh. And the feminist said, oh, I don't, know, I don't know if I like that. Why did God make woman? Because man was lacking without her. Okay? It was not man's idea to make a woman. Man did not create a woman. Right? Like I said before, that's why guys have a really hard time understanding girls, because they are not the creation of man, they're, they're, they're creation of God. The word helper right, is an important word, because why, why am I saying that women are, are not just women in general, but the woman is made for the man? Because what I'm not saying is all women are designed for all men. That's not what this says. Right? This is a particular instance of a marriage that this woman is made for this man. Okay? But the word helper, that's her main job. That's what we learned about her so far. She's a helper. What's that word mean? Well, uh, it's the word which basically means if you're a helper of somebody, there's someone that's in need of help, okay? And you can provide that help. So do you know who the most often uh, person in the Bible who's quoted to be the helper is? It's God, okay? God is usually the one when you say, oh, someone's a helper. It's like, oh, well, who are we usually talking about? Usually in the Bible, you're talking about God. God is called the helper of his people, okay? Exodus 18, verse 4 says, the God of my father was my help, and he delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. That's Moses speaking. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. It's a famous section about trusting God, but it says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? Same word. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Okay? What it means to be a helper means someone's in need of help, and you can do something to help them. That's kind of our, <laughs> I know that's using the word in the definition, but you're providing some assistance, some aid that could not be done without them. And if you think, wow, it's kind of extreme to say that woman was made for man. Is that like really the truth? You should write this passage down. Maybe let's turn to this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Once you write that down, you can turn there and start in verse number 9 so you know that I'm not making this up. And by the way, that's why we have Bibles. That's why I want you to look at the Bibles. Don't trust what I'm saying. Read what the text says. If what I say lines up with the text, then agree with it. If it doesn't, then don't agree with it. 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 9. Start there. You're going to be like, oh, I get where Pastor John got this wording from. He just, like, stole it. I did. But I'm telling you where I stole it from. I'm citing my sources, okay? Look at this. 1 Corinthians 11, 9. Neither was man created for woman, but women for man. Okay, well, that's where I got the wording from. But if you drop, or if you look one verse up, look what it says in verse number eight. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. So you can write down letter C. That's the next thing, that man, uh, or that woman rather, is made from man. Super important. Woman is made from man. And we saw that in the text. How did God do it? He used his rib, that rib of Adam, to make uh, Eve, the wife, the woman. What are the implications of that, right? What's he trying to say here? Well, in 1 Corinthians 11, there's this debate in this church about wearing a head covering. And the reason why that was big, especially at the time, was in that society, if a woman covered her head, that was a sign that mostly she was married, right? A woman who walked around without a head covering was trying to say, hey, I'm single and ready to mingle, basically, right? <laughs> and in this church, these women were like, hey, we're free in Christ. You know what we should do? Let's take off those head coverings, right? And Paul says, whoa, 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 hold on. <laughs> like, what is that saying to everybody? It's saying, I'm single and ready to mingle. And if you're married, how about you don't do things that say I'm single and ready to mingle because you're not, right? You're not single and you probably shouldn't be mingling, right? Like, you shouldn't do that, right? So he says, hey, let's remember back at the beginning. And he takes them back to the beginning here in verse number eight, nine. He says, okay, remember, like even like go to verse uh, number seven, just one verse up. It says, for man ought not to cover his head since he's the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. It doesn't say that woman is the image of man because Genesis 1 says that woman is made in the image of God, but he, she is the glory of man. Here's another way of putting it. Okay? One very famous, very old author put it this way. A man named Matthew Henry. He wrote a commentary that's super, super famous, and I think it published it in 1703. Okay? So before the United States was its own country, here's what he said about this text. I think it's great. 
He says, if man is the head, then she is the crown, a crown to her husband, the crown of the visible creation, like the top. What's the last thing that God makes? Woman. What's the best thing that God makes? Woman. Here's what he says next. He says, the man was dust refined, right? That's how he made us, dust refined, better than dust, but made of dust. But the woman was dust double refined, one uh, removed further from the earth. So even further away from the earth. So um, what does that teach us? Well, it teaches us a couple things. One, that men and women are made of the same substance, yet come from a different source, right? God made man from the dust. He made woman from man. But they share the same substance because they're both made in the image of God. So there's some equality there, right? Like, hey, we're both the same stuff, right? It's not like men and women are different species. We're the same species, but there is a different authority and expectation that he expects for a man and a woman when they're married, right? And if you're in 1 Corinthians 11, look at verse 3. Go up to verse number 3. Look what he says here. I'm kind of working backwards in this text, but read it. It says, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The word head is the word kephala in the Greek. It means the, the source of authority. It says, hey, every guy in this church that he's talking to, you know who your head is? You know who your authority is? You know who you need to listen to? Jesus Christ. He's your head. Right? You, you better be in right relationship with the head, Jesus. He says, and the head of a wife is her husband. Which really, those words, if you have uh, footnotes, those are just the general words for man and woman. ESV translators insert their idea that what we're talking about here is a husband and wife. Because in the context, that's true. But these are just the words for man and woman. I prefer those words because they're the words we get in Genesis. It says that the head of woman is man. The head of a wife, in the, in the context, is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. Right, so here's a question for you. Um, if you're thinking about theology... Is God the Father better in substance or in praise than Christ, the Son? The answer is no. Are they the same exact thing when it comes to their role, responsibility, and authority? The Bible would say, no, it's not exactly how it's presented. Christ submits to the Son voluntarily. He's not less than, but he voluntarily submits to to the Father. The Son submits to the Father. Did I say the Father submits to the Son? That was heresy, okay? Um, the Son submits to the Father. That's what I meant. You knew what I meant. It's right there. I just clarified. So the Father does not submit to the Son. The Son does submit to the Father voluntarily, okay? Uh, the way that theologians have put this is equal in value, different in function, okay? Same thing applies to men and women. Equal in value, different in function. function. And in this situation, you've got a situation where you've got a husband and a wife who have a different role, we do learn that here. And by the way, uh, before we get away from Genesis 2, I said this before, but the first thing that man does is praise his wife, right? Uh, that's an interesting, important marriage insight that uh, people should probably uh, praise their wife, right? Men should praise their wife. If you've been reading the DBR, you, maybe you took a break for the last couple of days, but we've been reading like the Song of Solomon. Did you notice that? And it's like, well, you, most of you haven't been taking a break. You've been getting back on your D DBR plan, uh, You've been like, what's all this about, right? Well, do you notice? What, what, what is she doing all the time? Like, ah, I'm not that pretty. And what is he doing? No, you are, right? And he starts listing all the things about her that are pretty, right? That's what Adam does. I mean, he doesn't give all the specifics, but he's like, at last, right? A wife, he praises her. He loves her. Yeah, and this concept of women being made from man is quoted in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, when Paul's giving instructions for that church in a different scenario, he's saying, okay, I just want to remind you that the authority structure in a church needs to work this way. You cannot have women exercising authority over men in the church. So that's not how God designed it. And the, and the reason he said that, so I'll just read it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. He says, I don't permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she's to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, right? That's, that's God's reason right there. Which like, ah, well, what if a girl is smarter than a guy? Well, there's plenty of girls that are smarter than plenty of guys. But he says that's not how it, it works in the church. And it better not be 
the way that you do it. He says, and Adam, by the way, verse 14, so that's before sin. So God made Adam before Eve, and for some reason, God thinks that's important. He doesn't tell us all the reasons why. You don't need all the reasons why. You just need to say that's what God said, so that's what it's going to be. But then, if you want some more reasons, verse 14, he says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So there's another additional reason, two reasons Paul says in the church uh, that women are not supposed to be the pastors. They're not supposed to be leading other guys. They can lead. They just lead other women, right? They can't be leading other men is because, first of all, that's not how God made us, which is, a, I mean, how, how much does that go against what the world says, right? That is very uh, non-palatable. It's not very PC with the world, right? But then the second thing is, and remember what happened in the beginning. Remember how they sinned. Well, who sinned first? Who's the one who led the other into sin? He says, well, Eve was deceived and led the man into sin. Now, it's interesting, right? Because in the next verse, he talks about she'll be saved through childbearing. You're like, okay, I don't understand what that's about. Well, just remember, uh, Eve was saved through childbearing. The only way that there could be salvation on this earth is if Eve and a lot of other people had babies. Because you remember what the, what the promise was? The promise was, there's going to be someone that comes from your line that will save you. The plan for Jesus to come to earth involved Eve and others having kids. Right? So that's, that's the reverse. And now it's like, okay, every uh, man or woman now comes from a woman. Right? That's how it works, biologically now. Where at the beginning it was like, oh, woman was made from a man, but now uh, all of us come from uh, a mom. Okay, so those are three things. Girls, you like the first one. Guys, you like the second two. But you should all like all of them because that's what God says. Okay, so that's men and women. We learn from Genesis 2. If you turn back to Genesis 2, what are some other things we learn? Well, we learn about marriage, okay? Which, again, these two things are related. I wanted to give the men and women one because that's uh, more primary. That leads us to understand marriage a little bit better. Uh, so point number two, you can write it down like that. Understand God's design for marriage. Super simple. Understand how do you design marriage? Well, the first thing you're going to notice in this text is that a man cannot marry himself, right? And he cannot marry an animal. So God has to make a woman for this man. There's one man and there's one woman, and that's what a marriage is. So letter A, you can write it down like that. One man and one woman. That's from this entire text. That is all that marriage is. M marriage is between one man and one woman. The ways we put that in modern terms is marriage is heterosexual and it's monogamous, okay? Those are the technical words today for those two things. Heterosexual, one man, one woman, and monogamous means there's one man and one woman. And if you say, wait a minute, what about all those people in the Bible that had multiple marriages, okay? I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, guess what they did? They had multiple marriages. They didn't have one marriage. It's not like a thruple, right, uh, if you know what that is. It's not polyamorous. There's a difference between polyamory and polygamy. Uh, both are outside of God's design, uh, but polyamory is even worse than polygamy, right? Polygamy is bad enough, and that starts in Genesis chapter 4 with a man named Lamech. He's a, he's a descendant of Cain. Cain was the bad guy. Lamech was even worse. And you know what he said in his rebellion? I'm going to take two wives. And the text even lists their names. And he talks about how rebellious he is. Like, that's our first person to take two wives. Bad guy. Right? And if you read the Bible, all these people taking extra wives, it's like a good or bad thing, right? It's always a bad thing, okay? But in those marriages, when a guy, let's just say in the Bible, marries two people, like is going to happen to one of our key figures, Jacob, he's going to want to marry a girl named Rachel, and then he ends up marrying Leah because he gets tricked by the dad, then guess what he does the next week? He marries Rachel, okay? That's not one marriage with three people in it. That's two marriages, it's not good. It's outside of God's design, but it's two marriages. That's an important thing. I, I don't think that was clearly said to me until I was older, okay? But now I'm clearly saying it to you. It was two marriages. Not good. But that's why what people call today gay marriage is not actually marriage. It's something else, right? You can call it a relationship. You can call it a partnership. You can call it a connection. It's not marriage, though, because marriage is designed and defined by God. So whatever that is, is not a marriage, okay? Another passage you should look at with this. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. Jesus looks at this passage. When he's asked questions about marriage, in particular, he's asked questions about divorce. 
which is even more popular than polygamy, polyamory, or homosexuality. Divorce is even more rampant than all that. And it was in Jesus' day, too. People were getting divorced. So people ask Jesus the question, was that good? Was that allowed? Are we allowed to do that? Look what he says. Matthew 19, started in verse number 3. It says, And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking. Here's the question. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Is that allowed in God's law? They're like, okay, you want to you dump your wife? She's older, uglier, fatter, whatever, like, and you just want to get rid of her? Can you just dump her? That's the question, okay? Which you should read some of the old Jewish laws about that. They're actually kind of crazy. If, uh, if your wife, I'll just quote one of them, if your wife did not make the food at the proper temperature, okay, according to some rabbis, that could be grounds for divorce, okay? That's the craziness that was happening even in the days of Jesus. So these people asked Jesus, they're testing him, right? Like, can you dump your wife for just like any reason, right? He answered, verse four, have you not read? The expectation is that these people read the book that we're studying, the book of Genesis. Have you not read? That he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. That's interesting. You know what Jesus does right there? He is defining what marriage is. Some people say that Jesus does not address homosexuality. He does. He does it right there. He says, this is what marriage is. Marriage is God's created, one man, one woman, a male and female. And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's like, haven't you read that? Like, they should all know that. Guess what? We just studied that as well. And I could ask you the same question now. If you ask a question about marriage and divorce, his whole expectation is just the fact that you had Genesis 2 should teach you enough to know that's not okay. He says, in verse number six, so they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Oh, and that's interesting, right? Who's joined them together? God. When people get married, who joins those people together? God. Not you. God. That's, that's a wild thought. Like that people who are married, if there's a man and a woman that are married together, who joined them together? God did. So, so don't you separate it. Let not man separate what God has joined together. Verse number seven. They said to him, okay, well then, why did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? Like there's this time in the book of Deuteronomy that he said, hey, you know, it's permitted to get divorced. Why did he do that? And he said, well, it's because of your hardness of heart that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Like that's not God's design. And even that, that kind of gives us our whole framework and, and presupposition for entering the book of Genesis. From the beginning, it was not so. That's why we're looking at Genesis 1 and 2 and say, from the beginning, what was it? Because we want to do it like it was in the beginning. Verse number 9. He says, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So, what's the design? One man, one woman. And then what happens here? You see the, the formula, leave father and mother, hold fast to your wife. Let her be as you leave your parents. That's what marriage is. You leave your parents. Now, that word leave, let's talk about what that means. Does that word mean move out of state? Not necessarily. Does that mean move far away? Not necessarily. In fact, in Israel, that was not what you were supposed to do. Like, okay, remember when God brought the Israelites into the land and then gave them those tribal allotments? And he said, Judah, you live there. Simeon, you live there. Ephraim, you live there. Right? These different tribes. Do you know what he did? He gave them an allotment of land and he said, this is your land allotment. So most people in Israel, like the Israelites, they didn't move away from their parents. So what does this mean to leave father and mother? It's the Hebrew word azav. And it means to forsake or to leave or to abandon, to reject, to separate. Okay, <laughs> And that still kind of feels like we're leaving them behind, right? Okay, well, this term was usually used in the Bible to talk about forsaking or abandoning the covenant that God made with Israel. So like um, in the prophets, we're about to start the book of Isaiah in our DBR. In the prophets, when he says, you forsook the Lord, like uh, Jeremiah 2.13. He 
It's just my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken God, and then they've served idols. Right? The forsaking God part, that's this word, to leave. To, like that covenant's over, right, in a, in a sense. He says that's what they're doing. So what does it mean to leave your parents? It means that that relationship is no longer the most fundamental relationship you have anymore. Right? And I, I know for most of you, like, excited about that. Right? Like, yes, I'm excited to, to be gone. But I would guess in a room that this size, many of you in your marriages will struggle with this concept right here, that you are now a new family unit, right? You still got to honor your parents, still got to love and respect them. But if you, as a lady, are more connected and more loyal to your parents and not to your husband, trouble. If you, as a man, are more connected and more loyal to your parents and not to your wife, trouble. Because he says here, leave. And what that looks like authoritatively is like, we leave the authority of mom and dad too, right? And in, in our world, that looks like leaving financially, saying, I'm, I'm going to cut ties, right? And I'm not saying it's a sin to get a little bit of help from your parents, but like, if you are so dependent on mom and dad that you need them to survive, and that's how you set up your marriage, I think that's wrong. I think you probably shouldn't get married until you're ready to leave in some sense. You're leaving their authority. It's a statement about higher loyalty is what it really is. It's not about geography, okay? Because in, in Israel, they didn't do that. They, in, in some instances, you'd live on the same acreage. You just kind of build a new house in their backyard, which that sounds like kind of rough, right? That's weird. Build a new house in their backyard, and, like, you're always living with grandma and grandpa. Like, you know, some of you, that's your house situation right now. You, you live with your, your grandparents. Um, that's what they did in Israel. So it didn't always mean leaving, which, by the way, ladies, can you, can you just consider something? that um, the person you should marry, okay, the person that you will marry, you are going to have to place more trust in than your parents when you get older. Don't marry a guy that you cannot place your full trust in, at least as much as you do your parents, right? right? Your husband's not your Lord and Savior, right? I don't mean like full and complete trust like that, but what I do mean is don't marry a non-trustworthy guy. Don't commit, don't, uh, you know, Connect yourself to an unfaithful guy. Don't connect yourself to a lazy guy. One of the biggest mistakes that women in particular make with marriages is they pick someone they love, not somebody that they respect, not somebody that they can trust, not somebody they want to follow. They pick people that they love, that they're infatuated with. Right? Guys have other problems, right? They definitely have the infatuation problem, right? Uh, but that's one for ladies. And guys, um, make sure when it comes to choosing a spouse, you pick somebody who's willing to leave their father and mother. If she's not, and if she's always going to be connected to mother and father and refuses to leave father and mother in this sense, not moving far away, I'm not talking about like going across the country or going overseas. I'm just saying like, if she's not willing to leave authority of mom and dad to come underneath your new authority, shouldn't get married because that's the design. Aren't you thankful you're in high school? If this was like Alliance or the bridge, like we'd be like, they'd be feeling it, right? But you're cool. Like you're not even, you're not even worried about it. Okay. Thirdly here, the word uh, azav means to forsake, to leave. The word davak means to cling to or to stick to, to hold fast to. So letter C is stick to your spouse. They go hand in hand with leaving parents, right? Those two words are connected to forsake, and to cling to. This word, devak, is used in the book of Ruth when Ruth is talking to Naomi, and she's like, I'm going to go with you wherever you go. I'll hold fast. I'll cling to you. It means to stick and to not be unstuck. It's used in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Not about marriage, this is interesting, but about Israel's relationship with God. God says, here's what your relationship with me should look like. Deuteronomy 10, verse 20. He says, you shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him. You shall hold fast to him. And by his name, you shall swear. For he is your praise. Right? So that's what that word means. It means to cling to, to stick to. Right? I could use it about you. If you're a Christian, you know what you should do? You should stick to God. You should be totally committed to God. You do not forsake God. Stick to him for your whole life. When you're 30, when you're 50, when you're 70, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, stick to God. Cling to him. He is your life. He is your length of days, as it says in Deuteronomy 30, 20. It's the same word, to cling. 
But now what is it used about? The person you choose to marry. A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast and cling to his wife. That's why in the Bible, divorce is presented as something that is wrong and sinful or the result of sin in some form or another. There is no such thing as a divorce where sin is not involved on one side or another or usually both, okay? Some verses for you to write down. Romans chapter 7, verse 2 says, A married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Okay, so that's how it works, right? Like, you know, if your husband dies, right, don't kill him, right? Don't murder him, right? If you want him gone, like, don't just get over it. But, uh, you know, don't kill your husband, right? But if he were to die, um, I'm not, well, do not poison your husband. That would be, it's not what you learned, right? You did not, don't love your husband. Make him food, but don't, uh, don't, don't poison him. You know what I mean? Uh, but if he dies, guess what? You're not married anymore, which is interesting. So, like, what we believe about marriage and what the Bible says about marriage is not as extreme as what some people who call themselves Christians believe. Like, for example, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believes in something that's more permanent than what the Bible says. They believe that marriage extends into eternity. Guess what? It doesn't. Your marriage in eternity is the church, the bride of Christ, married to Christ. It's not individuals married to each other. So guess what? Your marriage, as permanent as it is, I don't say it's permanent, right? Because no marriage is permanent permanent, it all ends when you die. So like when you pick a spouse, like pick a good one, but like, you know, don't say we're with each other forever. Like, cause you're not, you're not, not in a married sense. You can be friends in a 2000 years, but you're not going to be married to each other in 2000 years. So that can release a little bit of pressure too, right? You're not making an eternal decision when you get married. You're, you're making a lifelong decision, which is big enough, right? I mean, so don't view it with less seriousness, but Romans 7, 2 says, when you're dead, marriage is over. Okay. Um, Malachi chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. This is another super important passage at the end of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 2. He tells these people, hey, God's really upset with you. And they're like, why? And Malachi's like, don't you know what you're doing? You're doing something wrong. So this group of people was breaking some of God's rules. What was it? In verse 14, Malachi 2, 14 says, the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless. So he's talking to a group of dudes who divorced their wives. That's what he's saying. You've been faithless to the wife of your youth. Though she was your companion and your wife by covenant or promise. Did he, that's God, not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was God seeking? Godly offspring. So, he says to the married guys, so guard yourselves in your spirit. And let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Which even even that's weird, right? You think you're going to get married when you're 30, right? You might, but maybe you should get married before that if you can, right? The wife of your youth. He says, no, don't break up. Don't separate. Verse 16 says, For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and don't be faithless. Right, which, by the way, if you were to trace how these things work, work sociologically, do you know what one of the most common results of divorce and broken families is? Violence. Violence. And the natural way that this works out is usually young men grow up to be violent when there is not stability. Like That's just how it works. But he says that right there, even in the Bible. You don't even need to read a sociology report to know that. He says, don't, don't break up. Right? So, none of you are married except for you leaders, right? But you students, none of you are married, right? I think, right? You have to sign papers at this point. And I don't think that's happened to any of you. Okay, good. Uh, so, cool. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to be faithful. Okay, you should prepare to be faithful, and this should put more pressure on you to say, all right, are you, are you choosing the right path right now? As you think of romance and as you think of marriage, are you setting yourself up on a good path right now or not? As a person you're going to marry, you're, you're saying before God and these witnesses, we're going to stay together. The last thing from our text says, leave father and mother, hold fast to wife, and then the two shall become one flesh. And you're like, okay, what's all that about, right? Well, the book of 1 Corinthians uh, interprets that to mean sexually together, right? Um, but it's more than just sexually together. But that is like the thing that happens when you get married, right? Uh, you're together. You're one. You were two before. Now you're one. So uh, the way you can write down letter D be one flesh. Be one flesh. 
which there's a lot of implications to that. When you get married, guess what? Now you're exclusively together in a lot of different ways. The next verse says, you know, naked and not ashamed. It's very interesting. This is like the one relationship in an imperfect way that we still see that played out, even in a world of sin, is that between husband and wife, there's naked and not ashamed. Together sexually. Some verses for you to write down. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. You're one. You're together. Okay? I could quote a lot from Song of Solomon here. This is what you read in your DVR. But Proverbs 5, verses 18 and 19 says, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Right? Whoa. Like, what? Yes, always. Right? That's, that's the thing. You're one. You're supposed to be one. You're supposed to be together a lot. Like, a lot. So don't be apart. Be, be together. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 2 to 5 says, But because of the temptation of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The, wife, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does, right? You know what that's talking about? It's talking about sex, okay? So that's what you're together in. You're one, okay? That's not the only thing, right? But that's, you know, for, you know, this side of the room, it's the most exciting thing, right? Um, okay? Uh, you're also together some other ways. Socially, okay? Socially together. You know what you do when you get married? You just hang out all the time. <laughs> Have you ever considered that? right? Ladies, have you ever considered that? Like, you want to hang out with them all the time, right? If yes, then okay. If no, then mm, probably not, right? Guys, you're going to have to hang out with her a lot, okay? You got to be okay with that. Like, do you, don't marry somebody you don't want to spend time with. That's a recipe for disaster. You're also together financially, okay? What does that mean? It means the debts and the wealth, of an individual. When they get married, guess what? Now they're not your debt and my student loan debt. They're not your car payment and my car payment. No, they're our debts. They're our car payments. They're our loans. It's our money. It's not your money and my money. It's one of the most messed up things that people do in their marriages all the time is they separate your money from my money. Women spend money that they feel like is theirs. Men spend money like they think it's theirs. And guess what? It was theirs together doesn't matter who made it. If you're married, you're financially one. Do you realize all the implications of that? You don't realize. I don't want to insult you, but you don't realize all the implications of that. You ask a leader about the implications of that. You're also together legally, right? In our system of government, when you get married, you are one family unit. You can do taxes together. In fact, it is very advantageous for you to do taxes together. If you have kids, guess what? You get a child tax credit. It's awesome, right? Um, you have more kids, you're just more child tax credits, right? You're like, wait, was, was Pastor John just being faithful to the uh, creation mandate, or was he just trying to get tax credits by having all these kids? <laughs> Let you decide, right? Uh, <laughs> it's not that much money. They don't give you a ton of money, but, and also it's tax credits. Like, should they have taken it in the first, that's a different sermon, but like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like they give me money for having kids, right? They just take a little bit less. Um, so, the ideal marriage, completely one, no shame, no sin. In this first marriage, there was nothing that was separating them. That's why it was very good. So, you're like, great, cool. None of that applies to me, right? Because <laughs> you're not married. Here's some things that do apply to you right now, okay? Just a few quick things. One, um, if you're a Christian, you're, you shouldn't be flirting with, trying to get together with, try to date somebody who's not a Christian, who doesn't agree with you about this. Don't date a non-Christian. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? You know what? I can find out a lot about a person's heart and how much they love God by all the compromises they're willing to make to date somebody who likes them who doesn't like God. I can find out a lot about what you think about God by who you choose to be in a romantic relationship with, even if it's something as small as dating, even if it's less significant, even if you're just talking, don't date a non-Christian, if you're a Christian, right? Uh, don't marry a non-Christian. The Bible is even more clear about that. 
1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, at the end of that passage about marriage and divorce and singleness, Paul says, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But the husband dies, she's free to be married to whomever she wishes, yet only in the Lord. That phrase in the, at the end is so important, yet only in the Lord, right? So he's saying, hey, if, uh, if there's a widow in the church, guess what? She can marry uh, any guy she wants who's eligible to be married, right? But only in the Lord. What does that mean? It means only if we're dealing with people that are in Christ. Don't marry outside the Lord. You shouldn't even entertain a relationship that's wrong. And then lastly, for everybody, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number four, last passage for you to write down. Hebrews 13, four says, let marriage be held in honor among all, right? Single, married, widow, divorce, youth. Marriage should be revered among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, right? Which includes activities that take place before a person gets married, right? Because you can bring things into that relationship. He says, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous, right? Marriage should be reverenced among all. If there's one verse that you can take away, that, that's it right there, right? Even if you're not married, right? I know you're not married. Even if you're not even thinking about it, even if you're a freshman who doesn't understand statistics, okay? <laughs> marriage should be revered among all because it's really good and really important. So let me pray that that be true for you. Let's pray. God, we ask that this group will be a group in which marriage is reverenced, that we would show that by our words, we would show that by our actions, we would even show that by our goals and aspirations about this. Pray for the people in here who have never heard this before, who are just learning what the Bible says for the first time. Pray for them in particular. But as they digest this truth, that they would see that it's from you. This is not some political opinion or some opinion from, from man, but this is the stuff that you have said in your Bible. I pray we all trust your word even more and live it out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.